Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 5. And tonight we're going to talk about in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. What does that mean to us? Now, because we are faith builders, we understand that it's possible to have knowledge of a subject in the mind and not necessarily have a full supply of faith in the heart concerning that subject. And this subject is something that we want to continually have a full supply and a full measure of faith concerning because this is one of the most important truths to our Christian walk. The authority in Jesus' name. What happens with the name of Jesus. And um, what I want us to recognize is the importance of the name, the the authority and the dominion that stands behind the name. I want us to be able to look in, and when we when we say the name of Jesus, I want us to have such a full measure of faith that the power of, of, of uh, that knowledge, the understanding of what I'm saying, the, that, that supernatural force of faith is released in the saying of the name. And sometimes uh, we, have, uh, we, we have become so familiar with something that we think we may have that And if we have not been hearing these scriptures and meditating on that, we could be deceived into thinking we have that. Because the only way we get that faith is by hearing and hearing and hearing. So let's take this time together tonight and let the word of God release that force of faith in us concerning the name of Jesus. Amen? And allow the Holy Spirit to edify us and reveal things to us. Do you think you know everything you could know about the name of Jesus? Me either. There is something that has been taking place as uh, we were in prayer in the Little Rock location. The Holy Spirit spoke to me uh, one uh, during prayer one Sunday morning and, and told me to begin praying for two things for the body. And first of all, that we would have a working knowledge of the authority of God's word. And then second of all, that we would have a working knowledge of the name of Jesus. And so I've been praying that for both the Little Rock location and for here. I've been praying for you as well, that we, you would have a working knowledge of Jesus' name. And so we're going to act on that tonight. We're going to act on that prayer tonight by letting the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit reveal more to us so that we can have a more effectiveness in the use of Jesus' name. Philippians chapter 2 is where we want to start because we want to find out how this name has gained its power, has gained its authority. You're going to hear me. I'm going to just go ahead and tell you now. If I use that word power in connection with the name, I'm going to correct it because I'm, I'm looking diligently to find the phrase, the power in Jesus' name, and I've not yet found it in my studies. When Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me, it is not the word dunamis, it is actually the word exousia, which he would be more accurately translated as saying, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. So because the Bible is not emphasizing this power in Jesus' name, I don't want to emphasize it. And we have in our society, in the church world, we've emphasized that phrase. We've got songs about it. There is power in the name of Jesus. That that phrase is not the way the Bible emphasizes it. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying I want to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes. I want to give... I want to give the specific detail that the Bible gives and not because it may cause us to miss something if we don't. If we get off just a little bit, you could probably verify that if, a, if you get off course in flying an airplane just by one little degree, you go very far, you're going to be way off. 
It might look like you are not far off on the numbers, but after you go for 100 miles, you could be in a whole other state than you're supposed to be in, right? And so we don't want to do that where the Word is concerned. We want to emphasize it the way the Bible emphasizes it because the Holy Spirit was specific in the way that He did. So as we study through here, if you hear me correcting myself, if, I'm, if I use that word power and then you hear me back up and say authority, I, now you know why. Okay, and so you may also want to look for that and say, because I, I'm, I, the Holy Spirit's just shining the light on that for me, that I'm, I'm not to emphasize that because he didn't emphasize that. So let's look and let's see together. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, let's begin in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. First of all, we see in this passage of text that it gives an emphasis to the fact that Jesus came in the form of a man. He humbled himself. He took the form of a servant. He came as a human being, letting us know that we're talking about the redemption. We're talking about the fact that he legally came here. He legally came here. If Jesus had brought any of his God powers, it would have disqualified him from being our redeemer. If he had come with his omniscience, if he had come with his omnipresence, if he had come with his omnipotence, then the enemy could have said, that's illegal, that's not fair, he does not have the right to be here. We know that Satan already confronted Jesus in different examples that we have of Jesus' earthly ministry that the demons would come to him and say, we know who you are. We know who you are. You are the Holy One of Israel. Are you come to torment us before the time? One of them said in one place, I adjure you by God. Adjure is a military word that means to command. I command you by God. The devil said that. A demon said, I command you by God. Why? Why would they talk so blatantly? Why would they talk so, so confrontationally to the Lord Jesus Christ? They called him, you are the Christ, you are the Holy One. We, we know who you are. What they're saying is you're not here legally. How did you get in that body? How did you get in that man? We know who you are. Why? Because Jesus was spiritually alive. But he stripped himself, this verse says. He stripped himself and came in the form and the fashion of a man. The Amplified says of verse, look at 7 and 8 in the Amplified for me. He took off what would have disqualified him, any of the God powers, if you, you say. He stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant, a slave, in that... He became like men and was born a human being. 100% the Son of God. But he brought none of his God powers, if you will, with him. He came legally as a man, alive unto God. That's vital. That's vital to our redemption because that's what qualified him to die. God can't die. He had to strip himself of that power. So it says that it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren so that he could taste death for every man, Hebrews chapter 2. 
It also says in Hebrews chapter 2, so that he could destroy the one who had the power of death. He had to take on a body so that he could destroy the one who had the power of death. That is the devil who through all, who, and, and to liberate or to free those who all their lifetime had been subject to the fear of death and it kept them in bondage. And then thirdly in Hebrews chapter 2 it says he had to take on flesh and blood so that he could be our high priest. So three reasons he had to take on flesh and blood. To be a legal redeemer, he had to come as a man. He was born as a man and Satan could not figure out how God got in that man. He thought it was illegal and that's why those demons would confront Jesus because they thought it was illegal how he got here. But Jesus said in the book of John, he said, I am the good shepherd, I came in through the door. I came in through the door. How, what was the door into the earth? To be born into the earth. That's the only way in the door. He said, the thief has, has climbed up some other way. And so Jesus born into this earth, 100% God, yet he did not bring his God characteristics or God powers, if you will, and I know some of you are saying, well, then how did he speak to the wind and the waves? Well, how did he, how did he multiply the fish and the loaves? Because the Holy Spirit came upon him. The first miracle was done after that the Holy Spirit came upon him. The very first miracle was not done until after he was baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I know that you have watched some movies and Hollywood does not have it right because the Bible says this is the beginning of miracles. The turning of water into wine is the beginning, the first. The beginning means the first. The first miracle was the turning of water into wine. No miracles done before that. Who was the worker of miracles? The Holy Spirit. So Jesus, alive unto God, 100% spiritually alive, did no miracles until that the worker of miracles came upon him. Why? Because he's showing you how to do it. You are 100% alive unto God if you've received Jesus as Lord. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Jesus said, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power. That word power is you shall receive the worker of miracles. One of the definitions of that word. Hallelujah. So, so Jesus, Jesus came as a man. Jesus as a legal redeemer came as a man. And he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He was tempted in every way like as are we yet without sin. And this word, wherefore, is a key word for us. Go back and look again at verse 9. It, it goes through talking about the redemption, talking about he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And verse 9 begins with this word, wherefore. Or you and I would probably more accurately say, this is why. This is why God has highly exalted him. This is why God has highly exalted him. Why? Because he became obedient unto death. He said in the book of Hebrews, you know the book of Hebrews shows us the conversation that Jesus had with the Father right before he came into the earth. It says before he came into the earth, he said, a body you have prepared me. These sacrifices and burnt offerings do not please you, but a body you have prepared me. I come in the volume of the book to do your will, O oh God. Hallelujah. 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 The will of God, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? So that he could make his soul a sacrifice for your sin. Hallelujah. This is why God has highly exalted him. Now, Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, John chapter 1. The Word was God. The Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. Did Jesus need to be exalted to a better position for himself? Is this high exaltation because Jesus didn't already... He, was the, he is the second person of the Godhead. 
He didn't lose his position as second person of the Godhead. He's still the Son of God. Amen? This high exaltation was needed for you and I. We needed him to be exalted. He was highly exalted and given a name. When was he given this name? After he came to the earth, after he defeated death, hell, and the grave, after he resurrected, after he had, had triumphed openly over Satan in the cross, he was highly exalted and given a name. What is this name? Lord. What is this name? This name is a title. This is not an identifier. This is not so that he could be, he could be, be introduced to you. Oh, let me introduce you to Jesus. Jesus, this is John. John, this is Jesus. No, this is not for introduction. This name is a position. This name is a title. This name is a place of authority. This name is the dominion, the right to govern or, or rule or control. And he says that he was given a name, given a title, given the right to govern, given the dominion. And it is a dominion that holds authority in the heavens, in the earth, and under the earth. Where was Adam's dominion? Genesis chapter 1. Is it 1 or 2? Let me back up here. Let's go back to Genesis I probably want chapter 2. No, I do want one. 28. God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So it was on the earth. Where is Jesus' dominion? In the heavens, on the earth, under the earth. Woo, glory to God. You know, when God restores something, every time you see restoration in the Bible, it always multiplies and increases. He said, if you take an ox, you got to give back four. If you take a sheep, you, if you take an ox, you've got to give back five. If you take an, a, a, a sheep, you've got to give back four. It was, you don't, oh, you took somebody's ox and it broke the, its leg while you had it in your possession. Just give him another ox back. No, no, no. No, that's not enough. God says you can't just give him one ox back. You've got to give him five back. Why? Because that's restoration by God's perspective. So what Adam lost, we didn't just get back what Adam lost. When God restored unto mankind dominion in Jesus Christ, we didn't get back just what Adam lost. <laughs> no, God said we need to good measure, press down, shake that together. We need some overflow here. We need some restoration, not just dominion on the earth. Let's have dominion universal wide. Let's have dominion in the heavens, dominion on the earth, and dominion under the earth. So at the name of Jesus... Every knee must bow of things in the heaven, of things on the earth, of things under the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So this is a high exaltation. And notice God gave him a name. He has given him a name. And this name is above every name. Hallelujah. 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 Let's back up to Hebrews chapter 1. Say back up. Let's, we've talked a little bit from Hebrews, but I want to look at something here in Hebrews 1. Let's look at verse 4. He would not, it, it also says here in verse 4 that he, and he, by inheritance, obtained a name. Look at this. I want to go ahead and begin in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. God is still speaking. Hallelujah. God is still speaking. God's not silent. He hadn't gone to sleep. He hasn't lost His voice. He's still speaking. Amen. By His Son 
whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his substance, his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. When? When did he take this position at the right hand of the majesty on high? After he had purged by himself our sins. By himself. Purged by, by the sacrifice of him, himself. He purged our sins. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Being made so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. The Amplified says taking a place and rank by which he himself became as much superior to angels as the glorious name or title which he has inherited is different from and more excellent than theirs. He, this is a place. This name is a place. This name is a position. This name is a title. I say a place. I'm not talking about a geographical place. I'm talking about a rank. If you were to say the rank of a sergeant versus the rank of a lieutenant, or the, the, you're, you're talking about, well, they have a higher place standing. They, they stand in a higher place. One stands in a higher place than the other. Do you see that? So when I'm not talking about a geographical place. I'm talking about a, 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 a dominion. An authority. It says rank. Taking a rank by which he himself, as much superior to angels as the glorious name, title, by which he has inherited is different from and more excellent than theirs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we find a prayer that the Holy Spirit <clears throat> prayed through the Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit impressed this prayer. And it is a prayer that we should often use for ourselves. We can pray this prayer for other people. But I want you to see what the Holy Spirit emphasized in this prayer for you and I. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 17 of Ephesians 1, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The Amplified says, fully flooded with light. He wants the eyes of your understanding. He wants your understanding, your perception to be fully flooded with light concerning these things. So that you may know. In other words, if you get light on the subject, you'll know these things. He, these are things he wants us to know. So the Holy Spirit moved on Paul to pray this and write this for us so that we can take this same thing and put it in our heart and mouth. What is it that he wants us to know? First of all, number one, what is the hope of his calling? Number two, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And I want to say money is the least of that. Money's included, but money's the least of it. The riches of the glory. The riches of the glory. Glory is heavy with everything good. Glory is goodness. Glory, the first mention of glory does have to do with finances. So finances is included, although it's not limited to finances, because favor is part of my inheritance. Favor is in the glory, and that's part of the riches of the glory of my inheritance. And favor can do more for me than money can ever do, y'all. I just want you to know, it can do more for me than money could ever do. So, so, but he wants us to know it. He wants us to know the hope of his calling. He wants us to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That means what you already have. You have an inheritance now. And then thirdly, he wants us to know 
What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ. So we're talking about resurrection power. He wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. He wants you to know about this resurrection power that works in the believer now. He wants you to know about the resurrection power that works in your life now. It's available to you now. If you don't know about it, you'll never tap into it. You'll never access it. But if you know about it, you'll be, you'll be using resurrection power. You'll be using resurrection power to raise your finances up. You'll be using some resurrection power to raise up some relationships. You'll be using resurrection power. Why? Because it works in us who believe. The exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ. This resurrection power that raised him from the dead. Now, it, now it's going to tell us how this power worked in Christ. The first thing that it did, this first thing that this power did was it raised Jesus from the dead. But it did not limit it. It did not stop in raising him from the dead. It didn't raise him from the dead and say, okay, I'm done. No, that power raised Jesus from the dead, spiritually dead, physically dead, brought him back to life, raised him from the dead, and notice it goes on and it says, and, and set him, this resurrection power raised and set, raised him and set him at God's own right hand, in the heavenly places. In other words, the power started, says, let me pull you up from here, raise you to life, and I'm not stopping until I get you all the way into your position. And then I'm going to set you as the name above every name. I'm going to set you as the one in authority in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth. He wants you to know that. He wants you to know that. Look at your neighbor and say, he wants you to know that. He wants you to know it. That word know is an intimate knowledge, not just a head knowledge, intimately acquainted with this power. It's like if you've never had my enchilada casserole, you don't know my enchilada casserole. You can say, I've had enchilada casserole. You don't know my enchilada casserole. Right? If you've ever been to my house and had some of my enchilada casserole, you could say, I know Pastor Michelle's enchilada casserole. You had an intimate knowledge of it, an intimate acquaintance with it. He wants you to be intimately acquainted. He wants you to know the exceeding greatness of this resurrection that lifted, raised, and set. Why? Because when you received Jesus Christ as Lord, you were raised from spiritual death. And it didn't stop until it set you at the right hand of the Father, seated together with Christ in heavenly places. And that's in Ephesians chapter 2. It says, He hath raised us up together, verse 6, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you are seated with, when did that happen? This resurrection power raised you and placed you, set you, set you in this position. Now let's go back to verse 21 of 1, of chapter 1. So this, this setting at the right hand is also defined in greater detail. Far above all principality. Far above all power. That's the word authority. Far above all power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. This is an authority that passes time. Glory to God. Glory to God. Set above, far above all. And hath and it's that, that resurrection is still working. It set him far above all and has put all under his feet. All things under his feet and gave him to be the head 
over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So this authority, far above all principality, far above all power, far above all dominion, far above all might, set Jesus as the head of the church. We are the body. It put all things under his feet. Where are the feet? On the earth because the body is on the earth. The feet are on the body. So this resurrection power that raised us up together with Christ and set us in this position of authority far above all principality and power and mind and dominion above every name that can be named, every name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are in Christ. He's the head, we're the body, and all things have been put under His feet. You've got to know this. You've got to know this. You've got to have an intimate heart, faith, acquaintance with this position that you're in. I'm above that. I'm far above that. Now, you're far above that when you're in Christ. The Lord dealt with me a couple of years ago. I was trying to to handle a situation. And in this... I kept trying to come at it from the position of a mom. I kept trying to come at it from my parents' rights. You know, I'm I'm a mom. And the Lord finally dealt with me and he said, I want you to start dealing with everything from your position in Christ. So I backed off of dealing with it as mom and I started dealing with it as who I am in Christ. There's a difference. If we start dealing with that situation out of our our humanity, out of our head, out of our our natural ability, then we're limited to whatever tools and equipment or arms are in that natural ability. But when I come from this position and I'm building my faith in the authority that I have in Him and my position in Christ and that He has, He has set all things under my feet because I am the body of Christ. You've got to see yourself as the body of Christ. You've got to know that you are the body. He's your head, you're the body, and all things have been given under your feet. So that means you are far above all principality in Christ. You are far above all power and might and dominion. You are far above every name that is named because you're in Christ. Hallelujah. 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 So Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The family of God. The family of God is named, it says, our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the family is named. We are named. All the family here on the earth, we're named. And all the family that's already gone on to heaven, they're named with this same name. We've been named. You could say, God gave the name to Jesus and Jesus gave us the name. This name is a legal contract. It is a legal, a spiritually legal, you could say, a spiritually legal contract. When I married Pastor Philip Steele, my name changed. He gave me his name. My name changed. I changed identity. I changed from being Michelle Cosby to being Mrs. Philip Steele. That's my favorite part. (laughs) Michelle Steele is accurate as well, but my favorite part is I am the Mrs. of this covenant union. I am Mrs. Philip Steele. 
I am named with his name. He gave me his name. Hallelujah. The whole family in heaven and earth is named with the name of Jesus. We've been given his name. It's a legal contract that provides us with the attorney, the power of attorney. And I'm using this phrase, saying that word power of attorney, just so that we can recognize from our own society this legal document. I remember Kathleen, I'm going to use this example if that's okay. When Kathleen's mother, before Kathleen's mother moved to heaven, she was experiencing some things physically and she was not able to give her focus to her bills and stuff. So she signed a legal document giving Kathleen power of attorney over everything that pertained to her. Kathleen had the right to sign on her checks. She had the right to change policies. She had the right to pay her bills. She had the right to whatever business her mother needed done, Kathleen had the legal authority in that document to govern, control, and do business in her mother's name. In her mother's name. So you could say, in the name of Jean Tillery, Kathleen did the business of Jean Tillery. She took care of the affairs of Jean Tillery in her name. Glory to God. So when Jesus says in, let's look at two places. I want to look first of all at Matthew 28. This is, now remember, when, when did the wherefore happen? Wherefore God has highly exalted him. What happened right before that? He became obedient unto death. So the disciples had no clue what happened on the cross from a spiritual perspective. They did not have a full comprehension and understanding of the blood on the mercy seat and the new and the living way being made and, and that Jesus had become the sacrifice for sin. They didn't understand all of that. They... they they were just so excited when Jesus, they saw him in his resurrected, glorified body. And so Jesus gives them a quick version of understanding. And this is one of the places that we see the word power, but it's not translated power in the original language. I want to look at verse 19 of Matthew 28. I'm sorry, 18. These are the final words that Jesus gives before his ascension. He's come back after his death and burial, after his resurrection. He appears to them. He visits with them. He's teaching them some things, giving them instructions. And in verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power, that is the word authority. It is the, he, the Greek word exousia. And I'm going to give you the definition from the Strong's Concordance. The right to control or govern. Dominion. The area or sphere of jurisdiction. The right to control or govern. Dominion. The area or sphere of jurisdiction. So Jesus is saying all authority, right to control, govern, all dominion, all of the sphere of jurisdiction is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world." So when he's saying all authority, all dominion is given unto me, I am now going to delegate dominion to you. You go in my name. You go in my name. I am giving you this legal spiritual contract for you to represent me. You are my disciples. The relationship in our salvation is likened unto the marriage relationship. The, the relationship, of, the, the, it's so close we are made one with Christ. We are in Him. He, His word abides in us. We abide in Him. We are one with Him. 
Hallelujah. It, it, is, it is a contract that involves this legal, spiritual right to represent him in his name. He has given us his name. Mark chapter 16. Beginning in verse 15 of chapter 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be condemned or damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. Now the way that this is... is Can we have a quick grammar lesson? In is a preposition, and it locates. So if I, I were to say in worlds of fun, there is, tell me the rides in worlds of fun. What's that one? The mamba, the mamba. Yeah, that's all they, they're like, the mamba, right? So in worlds of fun, there's the mamba. In worlds of fun, there's the detonator. In worlds of fun, there is the prowler, right? Timberwolf. I'm telling you, all of those things are in worlds of fun. I'm telling you where they're located, right? I'm, giving, I'm saying that all of those things are there. So when it goes through here, it doesn't... In, in my name isn't just limited to the first action. If you wanted to, you could say, In my name shall they cast out devils. In my name they shall speak with new tongues. In my name they shall take up serpents. In my name, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The in my name qualifies for each one of those. Why? Because he's telling us that this, these actions are a part of us representing him as we go in his name. Go with me to Luke chapter 10. This was not the first time Jesus had delegated authority. I want you to see this delegated authority in Luke chapter 10. Verse 1, after these things the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would go. Do, do you notice that word sent? He sent them. He sent them. Verse 2, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send. Send. He's sending them. Send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you. I'm sending you, so therefore I'm going to equip you. I send you forth as lamb among, lambs among wolves. And now he gives some instructions. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house and into whatsoever city you enter. And they receive you. Eat such things as are set before you. Heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come near unto you but into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not go your ways out into the streets of the same and say even the very dust of your city which cleaves on us we do wipe off against you notwithstanding be sure of this that the kingdom of God has come near unto you what is he doing he's sending them and he's giving specific instruction look with me at verse 16 he says he that hears you Hears me. He that hears you, hears me. Why? Because you're not going in your idea. You're not going in your power. You're not going in your representation. You're going because I'm sending you. So the one, when they hear you, they're really hearing me. He that hears you, hears me. And he that despises you, 
despises me. And he that despises me is really despising the one who sent me because I'm sent is what he's saying. Now, so Jesus delegated authority. This is the authority he was operating in as a righteous man of God on the earth anointed by the Holy Ghost. This was before he had been given the name that is above every name. He still had authority. He had authority to speak to the wind and the waves. He had authority to command the multiplication of the fish and the bread. We have that same authority. We're made in his image. We look like Jesus did when he walked on the earth. Especially if you've received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We look just like him. We're alive with the life of God and we have put on the baptism of the Holy Spirit like a jacket. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what it means to be endued with power. It means to put on like a coat. Put on the power. like, like That's the power of the Holy Spirit that comes on you. That's, that's a different thing. Hallelujah. But we look just like Jesus did. He was exemplifying for us, showing us how to operate on this earth. Hallelujah. So this is the authority. He was able to delegate that authority. Look what happens in verse 17. The 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. How? Through your name. Did it say through the power of your name? It didn't say that, did it? Through your name. Through your name. They are subject to us. Through your name. So even in this, before the resurrection, before the high exaltation, the authority that Jesus was operating here on the earth as a righteous man anointed by God, he was capable of delegating that authority, capable of delegating the use of the name, and they went out and used the name and came back shocked and, 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 and saying, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. Glory to God. How much better, you and I, with the name of Jesus given unto us. How much better, you and I. Now, can you take a little bit more? Yeah. Okay, John, I, I shouldn't even ask that. Y'all are used to pastor. I mean, he just shovels it down your throat around here. John chapter 14. I want to show you the three places. Now, in John 14, 15, and 16, this is all one long conversation. The Lord Jesus Christ knows that he's about to go to the cross and he is having a heart-to-heart -heart talk with his disciples and telling them the most important things that they need to know before this major transition takes place. What's about to happen? Things are about to change in the the government, governance of the kingdoms. Why? Because the new and living way is about to be opened. It's about to be available for people to come to God the Father through the blood of Jesus. People are going to be able to be saved and talk to God for themselves. They don't have to go and carry lambs and goats and bulls to the, the, old, the, the tabernacle and, and have to be consistently aware of consciousness of sin, but they're about to be delivered from sin and be entering into relationship with God. They don't know all that, but there are two major things that Jesus Christ goes over in these three chapters, two major points. The first thing that we're going to look at tonight is the name the name, he's going to emphasize that. The second thing that he emphasizes is being led by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because that wasn't available to them before. And now it's going to be the main important way that they follow the directions of God is to learn how to follow the Holy Spirit. So tonight we're going to look at what Jesus emphasized in, these, in this conversation about the name. This is him delegating the name. John chapter 14, let's look first of all at verse 10. John 14, 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? 
The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Remember what he said? He that hears you, hears me. And they're really hearing the one that sent me. He says, I, the words that I speak, I do not speak of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Whew, glory to God. I do, Lord. I believe you are in the Father and the Father in you. Hallelujah. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. Do you believe that? Hallelujah. 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 Now, he's talking about the greater works. He's talking about the works he has done. Laying hands on the sick. Raising the widow of Nain's son from the dead. Blind Bartimaeus isn't blind anymore. The woman who had the issue of blood was restored to wholeness. Hallelujah. He spoke a word and the centurion servant was made whole miles away by one word from Jesus in another part of town. And now he's telling them, you're going to do these works. You're going to do these works. These works that I do shall you do also. Is it in red in your Bible? I'm not making this up. This is in your Bible. Jesus said it. Red words win. Red words. They win every time. Jesus said the works that I do, you will do also. Now, verse 13 is still connected to that thought. Whatsoever you shall ask. That word ask, it actually is also defined require or demand. Whatsoever you shall require, demand, or petition in my name. What's he talking about? You doing the greater works. You standing at somebody's hospital bed and commanding them to be healed. You looking at an impossible situation and commanding it to come back to life, to turn. He says, these works shall you do. Whatsoever you shall ask, require, demand, petition in my name, representing me as my representative, I'm giving you the authority to do this. I'm giving you the legal right to require in my name. They'd never had this before. They'd never had this, this liberty. When they, when they were sent... They had it in Luke 10 when they were sent to do certain things in certain cities. But now he's saying whatever you require to do the greater works, you ask it, you require it in my name, I will do it. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. How do I glorify the Son and thus glorify the Father? I require it in Jesus' name. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will do. Hallelujah. So this is specifically talking, not necessarily limiting, but in context, he's talking about the signs, the wonders, and miracles that he has done. That he has given you his name so that you can do those. Uh, Annie Durant came, uh, she, Kevin and Annie Durant have come here to this church before and she was with me in the church in Little Rock earlier this year because she happened to be in that neighborhood. And so we had her for a Sunday. And Annie Durant was on the Rama Singers and Band. If you watch some of the old videos of Brother Hagen, you can see her singing on there. 
She traveled with Brother Hagen on that team for many years. Her and her husband both did. He plays the trumpet and she sang in the Rhema Singers. And um, Brother Hagen, when he would be praying for the sick, he would say, Annie, come here. He would lay his hands on her, hands, impart anointing into her and send her out in the crowd to help him pray for the sick. This occurred often enough that after a while she would be up singing while he would be out praying and she could feel the anointing in her hands and he would say, Annie, is the anointing coming on you? And she said, yes, sir, I can feel it in my hands. And he said, well, come down here and pray for the sick. I was talking to her over dinner and I wanted to ask her about ministering healing, the anointing of the ministry of healing, how that anointing flowed and operated. And in my conversation, she said that Brother Hagen told her, the name of Jesus will do just as much as any healing anointing will do. And she said, so to prove it to myself, I spent an entire year never ministering the anointing. I laid hand, I ministered to every person in the name. I used the name of Jesus and she said, I got them all healed. Hallelujah. Using the name, not, and she said, not using any of the, the, minist- the anointing, the ministering of the anointing of the healing. She said, I just used the name. And she said it was 100% results with the name. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. We have gifts of healings. Praise God. But we can't determine when they turn on and when they turn off. They operate as the Holy Spirit wills. I can't make a gift of healing operate. Only he can. But I can always use the name. I can use the name. That's why we need to build our faith about it. Because it doesn't happen just because I have a head knowledge about it. Oh, if you you just say, oh, in the name of Jesus, and you don't have a great faith in your heart. Let's say, for instance, you are very flippant with the name. And you stump your toe and you say, oh, Jesus. Well, then you don't, you're not operating in the power of that name because you're not even respecting it enough to save it. When you say the name of Jesus, every angel in the room stands at attention. And they have been at constant attention all night. Y'all just got to know because we've been talking about the name of Jesus and they are, they are at strict attention. Why? Because this is the name that holds all authority. Hallelujah. So Jesus, in reference to how you do the mighty works, these greater works, he says, if you'll ask it in my name, I'll do it. I'll be glorified and the Father will be glorified in me. Hallelujah. But he doesn't limit it just to the application of the greater works. John chapter 15 and verse... 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Now we're going to about to find out what he chose and ordained for your life. This is what Jesus has chosen and ordained over your life. That you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father... In my name, he may give it to you. Glory to God. Fruit bearing. This whole chapter, he's talking about you being the branch and him being the vine. He's the vine. The the life, the force that's in the vine is in the branch. And the fruit grows on the branch. And he's saying that fruit which includes answered prayer. We also saw over the offering today, fruits of righteousness are connected with financial harvest. That's one of my fruits of righteousness. He wants fruit to abound and remain. And one of the ways that you become fruitful in your Christian life, fruitful in getting your prayers answered, fruitful in receiving the supply, fruitful in your your, uh, spiritual strength, is through the use of his name. That your fruit should remain so that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father, ask of the Father, 
Lord, I need this. Father, I need this. And I'm asking, I'm requiring, I'm petitioning in the name. You know what this is saying? Do you think if Jesus walked into the throne room and said, Father, we have need of this. I'm asking, I'm petitioning for you to give this to me. Do you think the Father would give it to Jesus? He's saying you need to expect this is like Jesus walking into the throne room and asking. When you come in the name, God sees Jesus asking. When you come in the name, God sees that, oh, Jesus sent you. If I sent you right now and I said, Lakia, go back and you tell pastor this. She would be going back to tell pastor because I sent her back in my name. She's going back for me to deliver a message for me, right? So he would say, oh, it's not Lakia saying that. It's Pastor Michelle saying that. She sent her in her name to come represent her and deliver this message. So when you pray in the name, God sees Jesus standing there asking. What kind of confidence does that give you? God said, oh, Jesus sent you. Jesus sent you in here to get that. Okay, here it is. Glory to God. If you, if you went into the bank with a check of mine that I had signed and, 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 and a blank check, I could send you in to a store with my check and with my signature on it and you could fill it out for whatever amount they give you. Right? He's saying, whatsoever, whatsoever, here's your blank check. Whatsoever you shall ask the, of the Father in my name. Here, I'm going to go ahead and sign it. I'm going to go ahead and sign this check for you, Lori. And then whatsoever, you just fill it in when you get there and find out how much it's going to be. Whatsoever. You shall ask of the Father in my name. He may give it to you. Now, chapter 16, verse 23. In that day, you shall ask me nothing. Now, this is, remember, one conversation. He has, he has continued to hammer this point home. From now on. You're going to have to ask in my name. You're going to have to petition in my name. You're going to have to use my name. This is what's about to change in the kingdom. You can't come ask me and I get it for you. But I'm going to give you the permission to use my name and whatever you ask in my name. And that's what he's saying. In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever... Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto, before now, have you asked nothing in my name. They used his name against the enemy. They used his name to apply healing and to cast out devils. But now he's saying, you can use my name to ask. Ask and you shall receive so that your joy may be full. If we want to have the fullness of joy that God really desires us to have, we're going to have to build our faith in asking in the name. Some of you don't have fullness of joy that you should have right now because you haven't asked it. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight and found out fullness of joy is just one petition away? Hallelujah. Fullness of joy. That's his goal in giving you the, the privilege and the right to use his name. His, his goal is so that you would ask and receive and get fullness of joy. Why? By asking in the name. Glory to God. Father, we're so grateful to you. We are so grateful that you have provided to us 
this legal authority, this spiritual supply system, this representation that you've trusted us. Lord, I am so honored that you trust me with your name. You trust me with the name that is above every name, the name that is far above all might and dominion. You trust me with that name. Father, I want to bring glory to you and to my Lord Jesus Christ by using your name in the way you've designed for it to be used as a representation of you on this earth. And Father, I pray for that same revelation and that same hunger and that same desire to be in the heart of every person under the sound of my voice tonight. Father, that you would place within us a revelation of this name so that we can work the name, have a working knowledge of this name for your glory, for your glory, that you would be glorified by the works that are done in that name, by the fruits of righteousness in that name, by the fullness of joy we have obtained by that name. And Father, we just embrace that revelation. If that's you right now, just lift your hand and say, Lord, I receive a greater understanding of your name so that I may apply your name, use your name to your glory for your will to be done in every situation I confront. In the name of Jesus, I ask it and I receive it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for that name. Thank you, thank you, thank you for trusting us with that authority, that right to control and govern. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, go ahead and stand on your feet with me tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Some of you are seeing your situation in a different light tonight. Some of you, the Holy Spirit has shown you where you stand in Christ. Where you stand overall, above only, never beneath, the head and not the tail. Above, victorious in Christ. Hallelujah. Don't let any circumstance take that image away from you. That is a, that the word of God transmitted that image to your spirit. And the more you'll meditate on those scriptures, you should go over those scriptures again because they have illuminated in you something that the world is trying to darken. The world is trying to steal the picture, the inner image, the understanding of who you are. That's, that's Satan's ploy. That's his desire is to get you convinced that you're a victim, that you're helpless, that God's not hearing you, that God's not helping you. Hallelujah. He has given me the name that is above every name. I'm fully equipped. I've got the helmet of salvation. I've got my battle boots on. I've got the breastplate of righteousness. I've got the sword of the Spirit, and I'm lifting above all the shield of faith. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Victorious. That's who you are. Hallelujah. He has given you the victory that has already overcome the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord, for that victory. Let's declare tonight who we are. Hallelujah. The vision of this church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. You and I will always be world changers. Hallelujah. Be blessed.